Hey everyone, welcome back. In today's episode, we're gonna be deploying the NSXT 3.0 Manager Appliance. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. It's something that's super easy to do. And actually the great thing about deploying it in your lab is that you can get exposure to pretty much all of the things you can do in NSXT, even if you don't have the capacity to run a bunch of workloads and that kind of thing, you can still do a lot of the configuration. So before we get started, what is the manager? The manager is actually responsible for the management and control plane of the NSX solution. So what does that mean? That means if I'm calling an API to NSXT doing some kind of automation, or if I'm going into the web GUI and actually clicking and creating networking, uh, logical switches, virtual routers, or security policies, I'm doing that all at the NSXT manager. So it's really kind of the brain of the solution. It is important to note that the NSXT manager is actually not in the data plane. There's no traffic that flows through it, uh, but as I said, it is responsible for the control plane. So it does track workloads. So for example, let's say a VM moves from host one to host four, the manager appliance is actually responsible for keeping track of what host that VM is living on at any given time. From a high availability standpoint, we typically want to deploy these managers in a cluster of three. In a lab environment, one is just fine and it works without any issues. That said, you can actually lose all three managers in a production deployment and everything will still function fine. But obviously in that case, if you were to move VMs around, things can get kind of wonky. So you wouldn't want to do that. So it's not ideal that these are down, but it is recommended that if you do deploy these in production, you spread them out across redundant physical hardware. So now let's start talking about the actual deployment. First, there's a couple things we need to talk about. One is the actual requirements for the manager appliance. And then the second is interoperability. So first, let's talk about the requirements. On the low end, you're looking at four vCPU and 16 gigs of RAM to get a manager up and running. I will say that in my lab, I've actually run the manager as low as I think around 12 gigs of RAM, so you can go lower, uh, but in a production environment, obviously it scales higher and it can actually go to 24 gigs and even higher per appliance. Uh, but as I mentioned for a lab, 16 gigs is ideal. I would not go lower unless you absolutely had to. From an interoperability standpoint, it is important that you make sure that your manager is going to be compatible with your vCenter and your vSphere host. So to do that, let's check out the VMware interoperability matrix. I know it sounds boring, but this is something that can save you a lot of headache if you just take five minutes to do this. So let's check it out. So you'll see here we have, I, I ran a Google search for VMware interoperability matrix. I'm gonna use the first link that comes up, which is the product interoperability matrix. So as you see here, it pops up and it asks us for a solution. So we're gonna go ahead and just put in NSX T data center. For version, we're gonna specify 3.0 since that's actually what we're deploying in this lab. It's also gonna ask us for another solution. So this is actually going to be kind of, we're asking what is this compatible with? In this case, we're looking at vSphere. So let's type in vSphere. And we're gonna to wanna to select vSphere hypervisor ESXi. So once we select that, if you scroll down, you'll actually get a list of which versions of vSphere NSXT 3.0 is compatible with. As you can see here, pretty much if you're on a version older than 6.5 U2, it's not going to be compatible with this version. So this is why I say it's important to check this out before you deploy it in your lab because you could save yourself some headache if the deployment fails. So for today's episode, we're not gonna to stress too much the interoperability because all we're doing is deploying the appliance. If all you wanna do is deploy the appliance and kind of play around in the GUI and that sort of thing, you don't have to worry about the interoperability matrix. This is more for people that are going to go a step further and actually try to put workloads on NSXT. I think it helps to just be prepared and check it out up front. So now let's get to the actual deployment. So I'm gonna flip over to vCenter here. So I have my lab vCenter here. I'm going to right click on the host where I want to deploy the appliance and select deploy OVF template. From there, I'm gonna select the NSXT unified appliance. So you'll see here it's version 3.0. It is important that you get the unified appliance. If you see anything other than that, make sure that you're looking at NSXT and not NSXV. So we're gonna select that and hit next. I'm gonna give it a name. For this case, I'm just gonna say NSXGood NSXT-Manager. I'm gonna leave it in the default location. I only have one data center in this lab, so I'm gonna select that data center and hit next. I'm also gonna select the host that I wanted to actually sit on. It's important that you make sure you have resources available. It is a bit of a, a 
resource hog when it's first coming up and then it will settle down and it won't be too much of a hit on your lab. This isn't really a worry in a production environment where we have very beefy servers, but if you have a smaller lab like I do, it can be an issue. So now it's gonna ask us to confirm all of the details that we put in. Everything should be fine here. We don't have to worry about this too much. It is going to ask us for more details. So I'm gonna hit next. So here we get to the actual sizing of the NSXT manager. As I mentioned before, there are various sizes, and if you click on the different sizes, you'll see in the side here, it kind of details the resource requirements. The one thing I wanna point out is, typically we recommend going with medium or large. However, as I said earlier, you can get away with small for a lab environment. I would say the general rule of thumb is, if you can swing a medium instance, go with medium instance. It's a little bit better performing, and it's just a better experience in general. Definitely don't go with extra small, no matter how constrained your lab is. Uh, this is actually, you can see here, it's specifically for NSX cloud use cases. So this would be if you're trying to integrate NSXT with public cloud, so native AWS or native Azure, you would deploy a manager as a medium instance, for example, and then you would deploy another instance of extra small, and that would be called a cloud service manager. So that's what this is for. For our lab, I'm gonna go with small, and we'll hit next. I'm gonna thin provision this. So we're gonna select our storage that we want this to land on. We have plenty of storage available. I believe the requirement is 200 gigs. Don't quote me, there's documentation on that, but I think it is 200 gigs of storage. So what this is asking you for is actually the network for the management of the appliance, nothing else. So in my case, I'm using VLAN 251, so I'm gonna select that. So on this page, it's going to ask us for all of the configuration details for our manager. And this is really where the important stuff is. So the first part is a bunch of passwords. We're gonna have several user accounts. So I'm gonna go through and just copy and paste my password that I've come up with. This first one is just a root account. This would be used at the CLI. Uh, if generally, if you need to use this, you've, you're having a bad day. The next one is an admin user account. This is gonna be our main user account when we log into the appliance. Finally, the last one is an audit user account, which is basically a read-only account. We scroll down here, it asks us for the username of the admin and audit users. So what this is for is if we wanted some other non-standard username for admin, maybe it was nsx-admin or something to that effect. We could put that here. In this case, I'm gonna leave it to the defaults, so I'm gonna type in the defaults. Admin and audit. We don't have to worry about putting anything here. These are for internal use only. You don't have to put anything. Scrolling down here, we do need a host name. So I recommend if you can do it in DNS, you should have an entry for it, but it's not an absolute requirement. I've deployed NSXT without a DNS entry. In this case, I'm gonna stick with kind of the way I was going already, I think I had called it nsxdude-nsxt manager, something like that. So if we scroll down here, it's asking us for a role name. If I select that, it gives me the option of the cloud service manager, which I discussed earlier, and also the NSX global manager. We'll come back to the global manager in another episode, but basically it's used for federation where I have multiple sites and I want NSXT to span across those sites. So for now, we're gonna stay with the default. I recommend you do the same until you get a little bit more experience with NSXT. The site name is used for federation, so you won't need it now, but I do recommend putting something in. So in my case, I'm gonna put Tampa. Here it's asking for a default gateway, a management IP address, and a management network mask. This is all just to access the NSXT manager. So I'm gonna populate those details right now. Next, we're gonna have our DNS details. This is just a DNS server. I'm gonna throw in uh, my internal lab DNS and my search list for my lab. My domain is home.lab. We're gonna want an NTP server. I'm gonna use time.google.com, which is what I use for all of my home lab stuff. And I will enable SSH and root SSH just for my lab environment. You'll see here it says internal properties, do not set these. So obviously it goes without saying, you don't have to set those. 
So everything should be good, so let's go ahead and click Next. Here we're given the opportunity to actually review our configuration. Everything looks good, so let's go ahead and hit Finish. So you'll see here it started deploying the OVF. This will take some time. It's actually about a 7 gig OVF, so I'm going to use the power of video editing to speed this baby up. All right, so the deployment finished, everything looks good, so now we're just going to power up the appliance. That will take a few minutes. It's important to note that the appliance itself will come up and be reachable on the network pretty early. However, it will take some time for all of the services to start up. I would say this is a great point to go get a coffee, a soda, whatever the case is, when you do it yourself. Not in the middle of my video though, no breaks. All right guys, so the deployment finished and as you can see here, I, I ran a ping-t and I haven't been getting any results. So the problem really comes down to something that's pretty common and, and I could have easily edited this out of the video, but I actually think it's important that you guys see this. So let me go show you what's happening. So I gave it an IP on the 251 network, 251.71, which is what I've been trying to ping unsuccessfully. If you go down here and you look, it's the network is set to V251, which shows connected. So that looks good, right? But let's go check the networking on the actual host. If we go to the host and then we select configure and go down to virtual switches, we're looking for that V251. If I scroll down, I see that I have this standard switch here, vSwitch0, which has no physical interface adapters backing it. So anything connected to this virtual switch is not going to be able to talk to anything essentially. Well, if you go down here, you see that I have three virtual machines on that, and one of them is my brand new NSXT manager. So that's my problem. So I actually selected the wrong network. So I wanted to show you guys this because this happens all the time. So the fix is just put it on my distributed switch in this case, which does have an interface here that is connected to uplinks. So I'm going to switch that, and then we should get reachability immediately. To change the network on the VM, we're just going to change it like we would any other VM. We're going to right click the VM and go to Edit Settings. Once we get there, we're just going to click the drop down next to the network adapter and hit Browse. Once that comes up, just make sure you select a good network that does have reachability to things. Hit OK and hit OK again. At this point, I'm going to go check my ping and it should be successful now. And as you see, we're starting to reach it. So we should be good now. So let's go try to hit the web interface. To hit the web interface with NSXT, pretty straightforward. You're just going to type HTTPS, then the IP address of the manager, in this case, dot .71. You will get a certificate error because we, we're not using a proper certificate. It's self-signed. So I'm going to ignore that. Once you get to the login prompt, the login is going to be admin and then whatever password you specified in the initial setup. It is worth mentioning that sometimes at this point, if you get to it too soon or you're impatient, it will fail or the web services won't be up and running. So if you get some kind of weird error, just give it five minutes and come back and it should be fine. So there we have it. We're in the manager. Everything looks good. We're going to get prompted for the end user license agreement. To pass through that, you just need to scroll down to the very bottom, check this box, and then you'll be able to hit the continue button. So once you get started, you'll see here that it prompts you with a bunch of stuff to kind of walk you through the NSXT manager, and it's actually pretty good. In my case, I'm going to ignore all of it because I plan on showing you guys all of this anyway. So the last thing I want to do is actually just show you the verification that our manager is up. Even though we're accessing it now, I'll show you guys where to find that. So anything manager related is typically going to be under this system button. So if we click that, we go to appliances on the left.
And you'll see here that it lists our one appliance that we've got here, and it shows the current status of that appliance. If we wanted to deploy an additional two nodes to be production ready and have an actual cluster of managers, we would do that actually from here. We wouldn't need to deploy the managers via the OVA. It is worth mentioning also, you see here, it does say a compute manager is required to deploy an appliance. That's because I haven't integrated with vCenter yet, which I'll do in my next video. I hope this video was helpful. If you found it useful, be sure to click like and subscribe for more mind-blowing content.